to that. Okay, welcome back to PLG Disrupt. And we are together with the amazing Teresa Anania, VP of Global Customer Success at Zendesk who is going to talk on how to incorporate tech touch to scale outcome-driven customer success. Welcome, Teresa. How are you today? I'm great, and thank you so much. I'm super excited to share this topic. What I really... so... Yeah. We are so excited because in this session, you will analyze and explain why now more than ever, it is critical to learn pragmatic, actionable methods to build and refine scaled customer success across all customer segments mostly by leveraging key customer insights and omni-channel digital engagement to deliver personalized outcome-based journeys to drive customer retention, loyalty, and growth. This sounds so exciting. I can't wait to hear everything about your presentation. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much. Really happy okay. to be here. The um, floor is yours. Great. Today, I really would love everyone to leave with three big ideas. One is how to really think about designing out that intentional, personalized, and excellent customer journey, and not overthink it, but really be able to drive a significant impact for your customers. The second thing is we all struggle, especially in the world of scale, one to many, how to measure impact, how to show up at that C staff table and be able to associate the work that you're doing in the scaled um, success world with the outcomes of the business. And then finally, just how to get started. I take a crawl, walk, run approach, and I'm going to share with you some of the pragmatic ways to get started. Okay, so first of all, when I think about a customer journey, I think about a great customer experience. For Zendesk, our customers have access to such a myriad of excellent resources. We have support programs we call advocacy. We have the community, you know, product forums. We have webinars, one to many. We have all this great content that helps customers learn our solutions and move along that maturity curve. But what is really tough for customers would be to try to navigate and figure out what do I need when as I'm starting from early days of just starting to get embedded with the solution and implemented all the way through full maturity and the gold standard of getting that full value. So the way I like to think about customer journeys is to really create a curated experience, a way to ensure that you're providing the right experience, whether it's human or digital, at the right time for the right customer, the right audience. So let me describe a little bit more about how we think about customer success. It always starts with some form of segmentation. I think today, many companies are using a traditional method of static segmentation, where you have arbitrary bands of, let's say, spend by the customer that might inform your method of touch, your high touch, your medium touch, and then some call it scaled or tech touch. I also believe data and insights is such a key foundational element so that you can really blend the best of digital engagement for self-serve along with human engagement where the digital is not working or is not sufficient. So for example, at the very top of the pyramid of your most important customers, that might be very much human led with just some digital self-serve to augment that. Whereas in your scale base, in your long tail, you are probably going to want to use a lot more digital methods and then only have human outreach when that digital is not working and maybe that customer is off track. The one thing I want to mention is where static segmentation is probably a great place to start. One way I'm seeing companies evolve is moving into more what I call dynamic segmentation, something where you're able to segment your customers, not just on what they've spent with your solutions, but what is their potential spend? Or what is the risk profile of that customer? Or what do they expect out of your solutions? And using that as another lens can really help you meet the customer where they need. Okay, so when we think about scaled CS, 
I'm always thinking about that life cycle, that land and expand, which are often in the hands of the sales team, but still very critical that sales and CS and even your renewals organization collaborate. So thinking about the emotions in sales for land and expand, and then looking at your CS swim lane and making sure you clarify the roles and responsibilities that are so essential to welcoming that customer, getting them successfully onboarded, and then making sure during that adoption and maturity curve of realizing the full value out of your solutions, they are getting the most ROI from your solutions. And then finally, where are we identifying not only at risk or customers that are off track, but where are those great expansion opportunities? And then how do you ensure the connectivity and engagement with the renewals team so that they know not only which customers might be at risk, where they need to consider some save plays for the renewal, but then where can we do some simple expansion as well? In a scaled model, I really value data and insights to trigger these different motions so that your team who might be assigned to even 200 or frankly 2,000 customers, depending on your base, are able to know who to engage with at the right time. I'm just double clicking on the importance of what I think CS really brings to the table is along that adopt and expand portion of the life cycle. How we think about it is with playbooks. So we look at what is that onboarding play? It might be tailored to the size of company, maybe for a significant enterprise account. It's more a complicated implementation, but then thinking about that scaled model that is so challenging, how do you take some of the insights from that bespoke, highly tailored implementation and fast time to value from your enterprise segment and really apply that to your scaled customer base? So maybe taking proxy for ROI, some of the goals that you see other customers like them in that industry expect to achieve with your solutions, and you bake that into, this is the ROI we need to deliver. And then for instance, on the adoption side, what are the plays we're gonna drive to ensure they understand their enablement, what the offering is that they are entitled to, and how to get the most out of that, it's not just the product, it's maybe all the other experiences that you're bringing to that customer as well, like support, maybe some professional services, maybe some training. And then what are the adoption plays? What data and insight are we going to look at determined from you know, good reviews with customers about what matters most to achieving that full ROI? And are the customers tracking along that maturity curve? to getting ever increasing value from the solution. When they're not, you can drive an outreach to get that customer back on track. Again, all informed by data and insights. I also love to leverage retention marketing, we call it, which is a digital self-serve experience to really lay the foundation of those exact touch points before the humans even need to get involved. So you might think of a welcome kit email or an in-product experience that allows the customer to get started fast, giving them very helpful content to do that on their own. And then your data and insights can tell you when that isn't happening based on the goals that you've set. And when that is the case, and maybe through your segmentation method, there would be a human outreach to get the customer back on track. The renew phase is just as critical. Obviously, we all know if you do a great job in getting customers set up for success, onboarding, and then later adopting and getting full value out of the solution, it really makes the renewal event a non-event. However, even in that renewal motion, it's critical to have a self-serve experience, maybe an ability to renew online or in product. And then when those customers either turn off auto renew or they give you some indication that they're not going to renew. This is a way to send in some human outreach to basically, again, try to save the customer through a variety of plays. Also, you can do the same thing when a customer might look ready for expansion 
at time of renewal as well. So that's a key element of the final business outcome. Retention marketing, I mentioned, is that digital self-serve experience. We at Zendesk are doing a lot with email, um, segmented, tailored, personalized for the customer with some great calls to action on the self-serve content that is most helpful at that stage in the journey. And then, as I mentioned, we have human outreach from my organization. When our data tells us they're not engaging with that digital content and we need um, a human to engage because they look unhealthy. I also want to mention in product, critical aspect of retention marketing where you're able to really engage with your users. If it's a SaaS solution, instead of just having that human outreach with maybe some of the key stakeholders, this way you're actually identifying the key features that that user may or may not be using based on the best in class, what they should be using, and then filling in those gaps with ways to engage to help them get the full value out of your solution. We happen to have a tech stack to help with this digitization. I'm sure you all have solutions for that as well. And Zendesk does play a big part in delivering that orchestrated digital experience. So a few things about advocacy for us, the support function, critical moment of truth with our customers. And we definitely believe the maturity curve and understanding where is the customer in that beginner status of deploying CX solutions, which we provide versus that gold standard. Where are they and how do we help them even in support when they're calling us to make sure that we move them along that assessment. I think, again, certifications could be a critical part of this, a great way to even um, engage with your customers with gamification and fun ways to get them to be advocating for your solutions. I'll just mention some of the local events, very interestingly, have become more like remote um, meetups so that we can get cohorts of customers together that are like-minded, that have similar workflow challenges, similar interests, non-competitive, of course, and share some of that in um, a digital way using Zoom or other remote technologies. Some of the learnings from our Voice of Customer program, we've had to learn not only how to build out various listening posts to make sure that we weren't just over indexing for our enterprise customers and giving them a voice, but how do we take that information from some of our top customers and match it up with what we're seeing in the community? We do community voting. There are ways that you could provide that feedback through your scaled approach, one to many, but match it up and really identify what are the top needs of our customers end to end versus those that might be unique to a particular segment. This has really helped us share with our customers not only a way to have a voice through things like our NPS survey, the customer advisory board, I'm calling CAB, but also give them that roadmap transparency. Let them see what's coming and when, which really builds that trusted advisor status. Some of my key learnings over the years have really just been one, collaboration across the organization is critical. When I talk about designing out that intentional customer journey, everyone has a role in that. So getting alignment and an artifact that you can share to basically get marketing and sales and the product teams all aligned to that intentional outreach approach and the way we want to engage, very critical. The second big learning is around data and insights. I tell you that many of us are B2B, but we got to be thinking B2E, which is my acronym for business to everything. This is like a B2C mentality that our customers are expecting from our companies and solutions. They want that app connectivity. They want that chat digitization. So creating those best in class B2C experiences allows you to really play both sides of the business, as well as getting that loyal user and trusted advisor um, with your customers. And I also mentioned waiting for perfect data is, I believe, a way that just delays um, the learnings from getting started somewhere. So I'm going to share a little bit more about that. 
And finally, optimization. It's really key if you can be a learning organization, agile, you're able to test out some of the methods with retention marketing, some of the methods with your human outreach, what levers are working, A-B testing, and what levers aren't. Getting customer feedback, surveys, et cetera, critical way to then iterate and refine your methods of engagement and the way you measure that. So one last thing I'd love to share before our time is up is the measurement framework. Please be thinking of questions because at the end, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes for that. So on the measurement framework, what I say about this is it's really critical to be able to think about that end business goal that you're setting up your organization to be held accountable to. For us, it's renewal rates. But we all know it has to start from day one. If you aren't doing a great job at onboarding and getting those customers to adopt your solutions, chances are you're never going to see that great renewal rate, but also the foundation on which expansion can occur. So how I like to think about is that's a lagging indicator, renewal rate. How do I think about the leading indicators that allow me to know that my team and the customers they're managing are on track for that ultimate outcome? We at Zendesk look at onboarding success as like first time to use, which is our proxy for first time to value. And then the percentage of activated users based on how many are you know, entitled to them through what they purchased. As adoption measures, we've decided on things like key features that really make a difference in getting the full value out of Zendesk. And you might also have suites at your company. So we look at things like how many products are being used in the suite to indicate adoption success, but you can pick the leading indicators that work for you. Then what I like to do is really target the customers that you want this experience to be available for. For us, it's all of our customers from the very top of our enterprise experience to that scaled model. And those customers then can be segmented based on the experience you're delivering, which of them are engaging and which of them are not engaging. And that can be with digital content, that can be with human, that can be with your in-product messaging. Once you do that, it's really important to suppress a very small but critical group for just that experience. So you don't wanna keep them in a control group for too long because what you're gonna do is not have them exposed to that same engagement method. Then you can really look at the attribution. How is that engaged group performing as first time to value better than the unengaged group and better than the control group? That's the theory. If your motion of getting them faster time to value is not resulting in that engaged customer getting a faster time to value, then obviously what you're doing is not driving that critical moment of truth to yield that ultimate success in the renewal rate. Same thing with adoption. If what you're doing for the adoption motions and engagement, whether it's digital or human or a combination of both, is not getting that engaged group to be better at adopting those key features or more products in the suite over the unengaged or control group, then again, you're gonna have to adjust, iterate, and really refine your method. But if you can prove out that your engaged group is getting a better result, then guess what? In the end, you will be able to then show that engaged group and the uplift that you're seeing in that business goal. And that can be quantified. And that's what really impresses the C staff and your board of directors. So finally, my crawl, walk, run methodology. I do believe in measurement. This is a perfect way to think about chunking up your approach. Pragmatically, you might start in the beginning crawl phase where you're just looking at engagement equals those that opened and clicked through one digital channel. Let's say it's email as an example. You're also looking at first time to use in a simplified way and maybe percentage activations. These are examples. For us, the walk phase then became, oh, now I can say not just engaged as someone that opened and clicked through an email, but let me tier it. Let me look at high engaged, medium engaged, and low engaged. So I can actually see is the lift higher at the top. That's a way to kind of add more 
um, specificity, but also, you know, don't do that, in my opinion, until you've perfected that crawl phase. You could also add more channels. You could say the digital elements of the in-product experience are attributing a better, let's say, onboarding fast time to value than the digital emails because you're getting more engaged and those engaged customers are getting a better result. And then you can also do more sophisticated adoption measurement, such as license utilization, product adoption, even value delivery. So finally, on the run side, I just like to say that really there, you're then starting to attribute that it's not just the team engaged, you know, the team that has the customers engaged is showing a better result, but then you could start attributing it to which levers are making the biggest difference. And that's when you can really start to refine your model. And finally, you can even do more predictive based on the results of that run phase. So my takeaways before I have a few minutes for your questions is start with what you have. Your customer segmentation, your data and insights that are going to inform those key moments of at risk versus maybe healthy and ready for expansion do not have to be perfect. Put a stake in the ground and just start somewhere. Secondly, building that engagement method, those touch point, I call it the touch point plan and the playbooks that I shared with you should all be about the customer at the center. It is important for your company to achieve its goals, which might be taking the customer along that maturity curve and getting more and more value out of your solutions and offerings, but also be reflective of what is that customer need at what point in time and deliver on that. So you're building that trust and you're not trying to show them all the advanced capabilities before they're ready. And then finally, measuring and improve, improving out ROI. I showed you a framework that I've been using that has worked. It has resonated with our executive leadership teams. I welcome you to think about what are the leading indicators in your company that could then correlate to that outcome, that lagging indicator. And then what are the things you're going to do to drive that result? Measure that and then tweak it, iterate it and improve it. So those are some of my learnings and some of the ways to get started. And I really appreciate the time with you today. I'm open to any of your questions. Could you please share how do you allocate your CSM to customers? How big portfolio, customer count, or ARR your, your CSM manage? And what is the role of CSM versus sales in customer growth? This is a big question from That's the audience. One. It's a good one. So CSM ratios, I obviously um, look at those and optimize them regularly. But I would say on average, and I've looked at the industry stats on this, in my very top of my pyramid, one to five is about the widest I'll go. Because having five high dollar, typically in the ARR range of like over 500,000 ARR is one way to kind of create that deeper tailored experience, but not overload your, your CSM. In the middle, it's somewhere like one to 30. That might be customers that have over 100,000 ARR spend up to that you know, 500,000 level. Again, they can scale best if you have the data and insights right in their UX so they know the play they're driving, the way they can have that conversation in an effective manner. You can actually start expanding those ratios a bit as you add productivity. In the bulk of business, they, they own about 8 million, you know, as I said at the top, maybe 15, 20 million in the middle. Um, and then as far as your question about sales and engaging with them for expansion, what we've done, and it's not like perfectly optimized yet, this is still, you know, I think could be better, is we've tried to say simple expansion is related to accounts. I mentioned that dynamic segmentation. So we yes. break up accounts that are lower growth potential, and we really have success in the lead on those expansions. And then the accounts where there's high growth potential, more wallet spend potential with our solutions, we let sales take the lead on the expansion motion. Either way, you have to have a way to coordinate, make sure there's that 360 customer view so you're not colliding with each other. Yes, I get that. I get that. And the final question, uh, what human or tech-driven CS campaigns have you found that have had the biggest impact with Amber Health customers? 
That's with what health? Amber health. <laughs> amber health. Yes, amber health. <laughs> Mia talk about amber. I say red, but same thing. Yeah. Okay. So I would say the best ones that I've seen are where we're trying to drive um, a transformation in a company to digitization. For instance, they're using, we could see, um, more traditional asynchronous channels in our CX solution. So let's say email, and they're not using some of the chat bots or the ways in social that you can. So what we've done is looking at the fact that the best CX experience is with a blend of digital and human, we will look at that customer and we'll drive an email and in product campaign to get them to recognize that those critical digital elements customers are expecting. We find probably the greatest solution with that. Not only does it help the customer recognize they need to start thinking more holistically about their customer journey, but honestly, to mitigate churn and contraction, much of it would come with their use of less humans, which is what we promote. We're able to help you optimize. Well, if they're reducing their agent count due to asynchronous efficiencies and self-serve ticket deflection, you can imagine that they're not going to need as many of our services. So the way I, I love this play digitally is it's kind of like a way to fill in the gaps for their digital transformation while they may be optimizing some of their seat count and reducing their need with the asynchronous channels. That's a great point. Okay. Thank you so much, Teresa, for your time and for your patience. Patience. Uh, we had some technicalities, but we managed to have your presentation, your seamless presentation. Thank you so much for all the knowledge and insight. And I wish you all the best for the future. And I hope that we meet again. Thank you. It was great to be with you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.